to a very familiar uh, book in the Old Testament, the book of Daniel, and uh, I'll read the ninth chapter for you this morning, Daniel chapter 9. Most of you know a good bit about the book of Daniel, hopefully. I know you've been through it in your Sunday school classes. Uh, among other things, Daniel is a book of history, and Daniel is also a book of prophecy. And when you get to the ninth chapter, you're in uh, the prophetic portion of that book, where it's really beginning to lay out details. And, of course, we're in our study on Sunday morning, and we're in that part of Jesus' life when many of these things are being fulfilled. Daniel writes to us. In the first year of Darius, the son of Ahasuerus, of the lineage of the Medes, who was made king over the realm of the Chaldeans, in the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood by the books the number of the years specified by the word of the Lord through Jeremiah the prophet that he would accomplish 70 years in the desolations of Jerusalem. Then I set my face towards the Lord God to make requests by prayer and supplications with fasting, sackcloth, and ashes. And I prayed to the Lord my God and made confession and said, O Lord, great and awesome God who keeps his covenant and mercy with those who love him and with those who keep his commandments, we have sinned and committed iniquity. We have done wickedly and rebelled, even by departing from your precepts and your judgments. Neither have we heeded your servants, the prophets, who spoke in your name to our kings and our princes, to our fathers and to all the people of the land. O Lord, righteous belong, righteousness belongs to you, but to us shame 
of faith as it is this day. To, me, to the men of Judah, to the inhabitants of Jerusalem and all Israel, those near and those far off and all the countries to which you have driven them because of the unfaithfulness which they have committed against you. O Lord, to us belong shame of face, to our kings, our princes, our fathers, because we have sinned against you. To the Lord our God belongs mercy and forgiveness, though we have rebelled against him. We have not obeyed the voice of the Lord our God, to walk in his ways, which he set before us by his servants, the prophets. Yes, all Israel has transgressed your law and has departed so as not to obey your voice. Therefore, the curse and the oath written in the law of Moses, the servant of God, have been poured out on us, because we have sinned against him. And he has confirmed his words, which he spoke against us and against our judges, who judged us by bringing us a great disaster. For under the whole heaven, such has never been done as what has been done to Jerusalem. As it is written in the law of Moses, all this disaster has come upon us before the Lord our God. Uh, uh, yet we have not made our prayer before the Lord our God, that we might turn from our iniquities and understand your truth. Therefore, the Lord has kept the disaster in mind and brought it upon us, for the Lord our God is righteous in all his works, which he does, though we have not obeyed his voice. And now, O Lord our God, you brought your people out of the land of Egypt with a mighty hand and made yourself a name as it is this day. We have sinned, we have done wickedly. O Lord, according to all your righteousness, I pray, let your anger, anger and your fury be turned away from your city, Jerusalem, your holy mountain, because for our sins and for the iniquities of our fathers, Jerusalem and your people are a reproach to all those around about us. Now, therefore, our God, hear this, the prayer of your servant and his supplications, and for the Lord's sake, cause your face to shine on your sanctuary, which is desolate. O oh, my God, incline your ear and hear. Open your eyes and see our desolations and the city which is called by your name. For we, we do not present our supplication before you because of our righteous deeds, but because of your great mercies. O oh, Lord, hear. O oh, Lord, forgive. O oh, Lord, listen and act. Do not delay your... Do not delay for your own sake, my God, for your city and your people are called by your name. Now, now while I was speak, now while I was speaking, praying and confessing my sins and the sin of my people Israel, and presenting my supplications before the Lord my God for the holy mountain of God. Yes, while I was speaking in prayer, the man Gabriel, whom I had seen in the vision at the beginning, being caused to fly swiftly, reached me about the time of the evening, evening offering. And he informed me and talked with me and said, O oh, Daniel, I have come forth to give you skill of understanding, skill to understand. At the beginning of your supplications, the command went out, and I have come to tell you, for you are greatly beloved. Therefore, consider the matter and understand the vision. Seventy weeks are determined for your people and for your holy city to finish the transgression, to make an end of sins, to make reconciliation for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness to seal up visions and prophecies, and to anoint the most holy. Know, therefore, and understand that from, a, that from the going forth of the command to, re, to restore and re build Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince, there shall be seven weeks, and 62 weeks the street, street shall be built again, and the wall, even in troublesome times. And after the 62 weeks, Messiah will be cut off, but not for himself. And the people of the Prince who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. The end of it shall be with a flood, until the end of the war, desolations are determined. Then he shall confirm a covenant with many for one week. But in the middle of the week, he shall bring an end to sacrifice and offering. And on the wing of abominations shall be one who makes desolate, even unto the consummation which is determined is poured out on the desolate. Amen. Amen. Andy, would you lead us in prayer? Let us pray. Father, we humbly bow before you today lord raising up your name as the king of all kings and lord of all lords father you've blessed us with with so many things lord thank you for all of our blessings lord father thank you for blessing us with our families lord with our church family with our church lord father you've you've been with this church more than we could could imagine lord and know that you'll continue to be with us lord help us to be a shining light for our community and in our in our county and our state lord Father, thank you for all the blessings you bestowed upon us, Lord. Father, thank you for our country, Lord. We sometimes wonder, but we know we still live in the greatest country in the world, Lord. Father, we pray that you'll open up the hearts of our leaders. Um, show them to do things, Lord, as you'd see fit, Lord. Just just uh, be with them as they lead our country, Lord. Father, thank you for everything you've done for us, Lord. 
bless your service, Lord, and bless us as we go throughout the rest of the week. Let us be a shining light for you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Everybody, let's shift down this way. Come shift down this way. Good morning. Y'all all right down there? You see some people you know in here? Yeah, I do too. Good morning. Everybody okay? Well, this morning, I'm going to talk about um, some some games that we play. Have y'all ever, y'all ever played games as kids? Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know what one of my favorite games when I was growing up was? Uh, no. Um, it was just regular games like Simon Says. Who's played Simon Says? I have too, and you have to be, one thing you have to know about Simon Says, though, is it can be kind of tricky, right? Because you have to listen to the right word, right? Because if I say, Simon Says, touch your head, what are you supposed to do? Let's touch your head, right? I say, Simon Says, touch your ear, touch your nose. Oh, if Simon didn't tell you to touch your nose, then, then you made a mistake, right? And you haven't followed directions. And you haven't followed the command, right? So you have to be really careful when you play this game because you have to listen for the right command. Sometimes in our lives, we live our lives like that. See, we have to listen for the right commands. We have commands from different people, we, and we don't call them commands nowadays. You know, we try to be polite about it and say, I asked you to clean your room. Well, sometimes we get asked to do something it's not really asking it's a polite way of telling you to do something right and that's just like how some of the things in the Bible are Jesus asks us to do certain things but really they're not they're not he's not really asking us he's telling us to do it because he knows what's good in our life right he wants us to do these things like hey, oh um because he wants us to do things that make our life easier, right? So there's one command. <laughs> All right. All right, I want everybody to look at me. Thanks. Look at me. Listen to me. So I'm asking you to look at me, right? And pay attention to me because that's how life is sometimes. There are things that happen around us. we got to focus on what's important, and that's what God wants us to do. And he gives us a really important verse here that's a command for us, just like when our parents do stuff, and it's in John chapter 13, verse 34. And he says, A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another, as I have loved you, that you also may love one another. And that's a really important command. Is it easy all the time? For us to love one another you think so when your friend makes you mad because they won't share their stuff nope. with you is it easy to love them then nope it's not i know it's not is it easy when you've played all day and you're tired and you want to go to sleep and your mom and dad tell you to clean up your room is it easy to follow that command right then yes. it is yeah you do that every time yeah, I don't either. I didn't growing up. And <laughs> Miss, I know who your I know who your people are. I believe that. So, um, you don't know my so people. <laughs> I know your people. So, um, so um, it's really important that we follow those hands, but it's not always easy. And that's why we have to do our part and ask Jesus to work in our lives, to do things in us.
to create us. We, are, we, have a, we have a sin nature. I know that's kind of a big concept. But in ourselves, we have the will to do what we want to do. But we don't always make the best choices and make the right decisions. We have to, we have to when we're little, we have to listen to our parents because they know what's right for us and they know what's best for us. And we have to trust that they listen to God and that he knows what's right and what's best for them and for their family. And as we get older, we have to read the Bible and we have to pray and we have to listen to God and his commandments because we know that he knows what's right and what's best for us and, and that'll help us be a better person so that we can love one another just like Christ loved us so much that he came to the cross and he died for our sins. So that way we can make good decisions and love each other that same way. Okay, so we need to remember that we love one another and we ask God to work in our lives. And those of us that have made decisions, we've had a lot of you kids that have made decisions here recently that have come before the church and said you asked Jesus into your heart and you've gotten baptized and you said, I want to be a new person. And part of being that new person is praying and asking God to work in your life so that you can love one another and that you can be the, act the right way and listen and follow the right commandments and do the right things, okay? All right. So let's all bow our heads and say a prayer. And you need to keep up with the baby you brought to church, children's church. And let's say a prayer. Bow your head and close, kneel, bow your head and close your eyes. Dear God, we just thank you for today. We thank you for all these children and the families they represent, God. We pray, God, that as we, we grow, Lord God, and we know more about you, and I pray especially for those kids who have come forward to make decisions to live for you, Lord God, that we remember that you have given us commandments, Lord God. We need to seek you, we need to pray, Lord God, and we need to love you. Lord, and as we love you, we ask that you help us love each other, and love all those people that are out in the world around us so that we can bring honor and praise and glory to your name and so that we can show others that there is a difference in our lives when we ask you to help us lead our lives, Lord God. We just thank you and praise you. In your son's name we pray. Amen. This shows you we got in good hands on the softball team 10 years from now as long as Grady bats in front of his mama that he'll run the bases. Right, Grady? All right. Number 493, glory to his name's off to our hymn. Let's all stand.
purpose, depending on what Baptist Church is and all activities to glorify God as the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, to call saints to worship and sinners to repentance. Thank you, Charlie, and choir, and musicians, and sound folks. Good job this morning. We appreciate that. I thank Tim for standing in for Miss Linda, who is uh, away today. And uh, so we're glad that Tim's able and willing to stand in and help us uh, during those times. Uh, don't miss tonight's service. Uh, we'll have a, a good service planned. You're going to have uh, another one of our folks that God has laid on their heart something to say, and they're going to share with you uh, tonight uh, that message. And then... Uh, following that, uh, we're going to have our group that went to SuperWow give us a little bit about what that meant to them. So you've got a good uh, afternoon plan for you. I wouldn't miss it if I was you. I plan on being here, so hopefully you will be also. All right, let's take our Bibles and go uh, to the book of Matthew. We're going to start reading at the end of the 23rd chapter and go down through the 28th verse of the 24th chapter. Now, to set your fears at ease, I'm not going to preach all those verses, Okay. Some of them I'll just capsulate in a sentence or two. The main part we're going to be looking at is these inverses of the 23rd chapter. And, but I wanted to read the others because they fill in some gap there. And uh, we'll talk more about that as we go along. 23rd chapter of the book of Matthew. If you're going to uh, read in your Bibles, hopefully you found that. For all the rest of us, or for all of us, let's stand as we, if we can. And uh, I'll read for us. <clears throat> Jesus says, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the one who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her. How often I wanted to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you were not willing. See, your house is left to you desolate. For I say to you, you shall not see me no more till they say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Then Jesus went out and departed from the temple, and his disciples came up to show him the buildings of the temple. And Jesus said to them, Do you not see all these things? Assuredly, I say to you, not one stone shall be left here upon another that shall not be thrown down. Now as he sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately saying, Tell us when will these things be, and what will be the sign of your coming and the end of the age? And Jesus answered and said to them, Take heed that no one deceives you, for many will come in my name saying, I am the Christ, and, many, and will deceive many. And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. And there will be famines, pestilence, earthquakes in various places. All these things are the beginning of sorrows. Then they will deliver you up to, tri up to tribulation and kill you, and you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. And then many will be offended, will betray one another, and will hate one another. Then many false prophets will rise up and deceive many, and because lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold. But he who endures to the end shall be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all nations, and then the end will come. Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet standing in the holy place, whoever reads, let him understand. Let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let him who is on the housetop not go down to take anything out of his house, and let him who is in the field not go back to get his clothes. But woe to those who are pregnant and to those who are nursing babies in those days. And pray that your flight may not be in winter or in, on the Sabbath. For then there will be great tribulation such as not been seen since the beginning of the world until this time no nor ever shall be. And unless those days will, were shortened, no flesh will be saved, but for the elect's sake those days will be shortened. Then if anyone says to you, look, here is the Christ, or there, do not believe it. For false Christ and false prophets will rise and show great signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. See, I have told you beforehand. Therefore, if they say to you, look, he is in the desert, do not go out. Or look, he is in the inner rooms, do not believe it. For as the lightning comes from the east and flashes to the west, so also will be the coming of the Son of Man be. For who, wherever the carcass is, there the eagles will be gathered together. You can be seated. We have come uh, in our study of the life of Jesus uh, to uh, a point that I have no doubt that Jesus 
looked forward to with great distress. Um, it was his heart, his desire, his reason for coming to earth was to present himself as the Messiah King of Israel. Great, wonderful, magnificent promises had been made uh, to the nation of Israel, beginning with Abraham and flowing down through his descendants from there. God had a plan for them, which was a plan of glory and blessedness. But that plan was conditioned upon them being able to receive it and following his commands. You know the history that uh, we've read to you and you've read of the nation of Israel, how time and time and time and time again they failed to understand their place on earth and what God had provided for them and failed to receive all the promises and blessings that God had so willingly uh, laid out for them to have. And now he himself has come, he has uh, incarnated or placed himself in flesh and he has walked among tabernacles with his people and displayed for them every evidence necessary that they might see indeed he was their king, he was their savior. And yet he comes to this day, to this point, to this hour when he looks out upon the city of Jerusalem and Jerusalem is a picture or a representation of who the nation is. Much can be said there, but for the sake of our sermon this morning, I'm not going to even delve into the city of Jerusalem. And so uh, he looks out there, and as he looks over the city, recognizing what it represents, the promises it represents, the people that it represents, his heart literally begins to break. No, probably no other time of his visit, sojourn, here on planet Earth was he in as much distress itself for the Garden of Eden, the Garden of Gethsemane, and then this time. Uh, he looked and he cried out in a lament. We read our English version and we, we take so little time to understand what's happening. But this is a distress of heart. This is a person crying out from his innermost being. And uh, he does so because he knows the future. He knows what is coming to this great nation. He knows what's heading uh, towards them. And he pronounces their doom. He pronounces uh, that now for what we know of have been two millennia, that the hand of God is going to be taken off of this nation and they're going to go under the ravages of Lucifer the devil himself. And they're going to go under the purging fire uh, that is going to be brought upon them. Uh, we know, and God certainly knows, that the devil has a tremendous animus towards uh, this nation of Israel. He does so because he knows that the promises of God have been made to this nation. And if there's a way that he can destroy this nation, pluck it up, and cause for it not to be here, he can do away for it the plan of God. And he has been for all the centuries trying to do so. Up until this time, though they had been under great judgment, and you can read your Old Testament and see that, and yet God's protecting hand had been upon them. Now he's saying... I'm going to withdraw from this nation, from my beloved, from, from those that I'm willing to die for. And I'm going to allow the ravages of Satan uh, to come upon you. And uh, all the, the horror uh, that is to take place will take place. He looks out and he says, Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, if you had only known, if you would have bent your knee, if you would have repented, if you had done what I said to do, then things would have been great. But now he says, but no, you didn't do that. He says, you have been up until this time killing the prophets and stoning them. And the tense of the word here is not that you have done it in the past. The tense of the word is that you are now doing it. And he knew that within two days, they would be putting him on a cross and crucifying him. He knew that they were not done with their iniquity. They were not done with their evil. They had not filled up their wrath. They were still in the process, out from the pathos of Jesus, out from his heart. He pours out at these people and he says, Do you not understand? In just a few years, they would be stoning uh, Stephen the prophet. They would be uh, uh, causing great harm and trouble to the church of God. Jesus looks out at them, knowing what was coming, and he cries out in this lament uh, towards them. 
And uh, he says, it didn't have to be this way. I would have gathered you up uh, as a chicken gathers its brood up under its wing when a fox might be near or a chicken hawk might be near or some danger might be near and all the little chicks would be out there in the yard uh, eating and the, the mama hen would see and she would gather up those chicks for protection uh, under the cover of his wings. He said, just as that the mother chicken would have cared for her chicks, I more would have cared for you. I would have looked after you. He says, but you were not willing. Now for those that teach determinism, and again, I'm not going to do, go down that road with y'all this morning. We're studying soteriology on Sunday night, so come on Sunday nights and you can learn more about what determinism is. But briefly, determinism is a philosophy that says that before the ages began in the eternal counsels of God, that the, the Godhead decided, predetermined, who would be saved and who would be lost. And those that would be saved would be saved, and those that would be lost were lost. And really, mankind has very little to do with, with it. Now, that's an oversimplification of predeterminism, but that's basically what it means. But when you look at this passage, Jesus said he didn't predetermine for Israel. He said, if you would, you could. But they chose not to do so. And so Jesus is saying here that Israel had a choice. And I'm here to tell you this morning, you have a choice. It was not predetermined for you to go to heaven or go to hell in eternity past. That determination is made by you today. You either choose to accept Jesus as your Savior or reject Him. And so uh, here he puts a death nail in just one verse, and of course there's much more that deals with that. And so he says then, in verse 38, See, hear, understand, your house has been left desolate to you. He looks at the nation of Israel and says, Now you are destroyed. As a matter of fact, he says, I'm going to take away the, the, the house of Israel, the church of Israel, the place of Israel, the tabernacle of Israel, but I'm not going to leave the world without witness. I'm going to put something else in its place. And pretty soon we find out he put in its place us, the church. Now, we have not done away with Israel. We have not taken the place of Israel, but we are God's witness in the world today. And as long as we are a witness in this world, God is not finished with his punishment of Israel. The sign that God is ending the age and the punishment of Israel is coming to a conclusion will be when he withdraws this witness, the church, and returns to his work with his fair Israel. That's the reason I, again, a lot, I'm giving you a brief overview of a lot of doctrine here, and I don't want to put you to sleep, so I'm trying to move right on. Past. But that is the reason I am a premillennialist. You may ask what a premillennialist is. I'm glad you asked. I'm going to tell you very brief. I believe that the church will leave before the tribulation period starts. I believe that the church will be raptured, not to get us out of trouble, uh, not because we, we're, we won't endure uh, a persecution, not because uh, we, we cannot be tested, we have been tested. I believe that we are premillennial because the church must leave before he begins to deal with Israel again. And so, uh, very brief, what premillennialism is. And so, Jesus says to them, See, your house is left desolate to you. And then he says, For I say to you, I hope you understand what that means. I'll put it in the way I can understand it. When we were uh, being raised in my house, there was a total of six of us, and uh, my daddy, by, by the time you know now, is authoritarian, and sometimes he would tell us, all right, guys, girls, uh, you guys, or why would he say, I wouldn't know how he'd say it, he'd say, all right, he'd, he'd, just, he'd address us, now, y'all don't do so and so. It would be a command generically to all of us, and generically all of us better obey it. But every now and then, he would look and he would say, Bruce, don't do that again. Now, I wasn't doing anything wrong. He just wanted to make sure the other children didn't get hurt feelings, so occasionally he would look at me and say, Bruce, no. And so he looked at me and he directed that comment. I'll tell you, he had my attention. I put my eyes on him, I listened to what he said, because I knew what the results were going to be if I didn't do what my daddy said. And so uh, that's what Jesus is doing here. He's saying, I'm saying to you, to the nation of Israel, listen, Israel, hear what I'm saying. He says, you will see me no more. What a statement. What a revelation to these folks. They had gone to the place 
where their time of judgment had come. And now Jesus announces it. Even before they cry, crucify him, crucify him. Even before they nail him to a cross. Even before uh, they persecute uh, the church. Jesus looks at them and says, your time is up. I want to tell you, what, a, what an awful, horrible word to hear from heaven. What a horrible word to hear from God. When God says, I'm done with it. It's enough. The time has finished. And I want to tell you, when Jesus said that, and he took his hand off the nation of Israel, he meant what he said. And a time of trouble such as has never been seen on planet Earth ensued upon the nation of Israel. I want to do something I don't normally do, but uh, is read or, or tell you about something, but I, I, so that you can get an idea of this. I'm indebted to one of the authors I read behind and listen to a lot, John MacArthur, pastor out on the West Coast, uh, been at his church 40-something years, a tremendous man of God. And uh, he wrote a bit of the history of what the, the uh, nation of Israel has been through since the crucifixion of Christ. I'm going to briefly thumb, thumb through that. i got five or six pages. I'm not reading you five, five or six pages, but I'm going to briefly give you a history. And I want you to see what he was saying was coming. Of course, most of you already know that in 70 A.D., Titus Vespasian, Roman emperor, had had enough of the uprising and the problems in the country of Judea and in that general Middle Eastern area. He sent the armies, the legions of Rome, uh, down to the area and said, I want y'all to conquer it, and any problems that you have, I want to deal with. He himself led an uh, excursion of soldiers to the city of Jerusalem, and he utterly destroyed Jerusalem in 70 A.D. The only thing he left standing of, of Jerusalem was what we now know of the Western Wall, where you can go today and you can pray, and a tower that stood afar off from that. Other than that, he tore uh, Jerusalem to the foundation. And in doing so, uh, he killed tens of thousands of Jewish folks. Then about two years prior to him doing that, uh, a, a group of folks called the Gentiles of Caesarea decided that they had had enough of the Jewish folks and they killed 20,000 Jews and sent others into captivity. In one single day in that same time period, in the city of Damascus, Damascus is in Syria, you hear it in the news today, it is the place that Paul went and an eye saw him and he was commissioned to be the uh, preacher to the Gentiles, over 1,000, I'm sorry, over 10,000 Jews has their throats slit on that particular day. During the Crusades, which started in 1096, uh, that's when the first crusade uh, took place, the Crusades were basically pilgrimages to the Holy Lands. The Turks had taken over the Holy Lands, and the Turks were basically Muslim folks, and it was a uh, in the name of religion, of Christianity. And I hope that you know that the Crusades and those that called themselves Christians were Christians in name only. They were not truly uh, most born-again believers. And so it was their job to go to the Holy Land and begin to dispossess it. And in that uh, uh, place, they had the idea that they were going to redeem and de uh, the desecrated places and reclaim them for Christ. Well, in doing so, they began to think and they said, you know what, if we redeem this land, we reclaim it, those folks that are scattered abroad that call themselves Jews, they may want to come back to that homeland and take it for themselves. So they, the crusaders, began the process of annihilating all the Jewish folks that they could have. And so they made it their task all over Europe and in the Holy Land. Any place they found a group of Jews, they massacred them. As... Um, an idea today, as you know, many Jewish folks have a distaste for folks called Christians. And this is part of the reason why. Uh, they continued to go from town to town, from settlement to settlement, and finding the Jewish folks that were there, and they would give them two choices. They could convert to Christianity and be baptized publicly, or they could die. We see sometimes today the cruel uh, Islamic crusades as they go across of that part of the world and they tell uh, those folks that they can convert to Islam or die. I want to tell you the Crusades did much of that uh, to, the, uh, to the Jewish folks in the early part of the second uh, millennium. 
Many of the families, as the Crusades began to grow, draw near to them as the forces, they would simply c commit suicide so that they would not have to fa face the ravages of the Crusaders. The, the, many of the ladies would take their young girls, whom they knew what would happen to them as soon as the Crusaders uh, would come by, and they in their dresses would put rocks, tie, sew rocks in their dresses, and throw them off bridges into the river so they would die and would not have to fa uh, face the persecution. As, a, as the uh, Crusades continued, the Jewish folks were driven into the villages of, of uh, France. When they went there, uh, the French told them that they had to identify who they were, so they had them either put a red felt or a yellow cloth badge on themselves so that they could identify who they were. Who they were. Jesus was looking down this course of history, and he's telling them, you've had the opportunity, you've gone past that opportunity, and now he, here you are. Uh, Philip the Fair expelled over 10. He, it, they were allowed to live in France for about 15 years, and then Philip the Fair expelled over 100,000 Jews from France, decided he didn't like them, didn't want them to stay around. Well, not much long after that, a great plague of the 14th century hit Europe. Tens of thousands of folks died during that period of time. Well, guess who they blamed the plague on? The Jewish folks. And so they began to exterminate and kill the Jews. In one area, an entire congregation was taken and burned together at one time. They fled from France. They went to Poland, to Russia. Uh, there they were chased uh, in, uh, around. Uh, they were caused to wear badges. And in Poland, they came under the conflict of the Roman Catholic Church. The Roman Catholic Church did not care for the Jews, and they began to, uh, to uh, cause great problems and dist distress upon them. From there, they were run throughout Europe. They wound up in Spain. This was in the uh, uh, 1400s uh, time period. And so as they, uh, they uh, fl fled to Spain, Sp Spain persecuted them unmercilessly. Uh, they uh, disliked the Jews. They hated the Jews. Now, again, I'm telling you a very brief history, but I'm telling you what happens when God's hand is taken off of folks. There was a king and a queen in Spain at that time uh, that decided they were going to destroy the Jews. They were named Ferdinand and Isabel. I think you know them from history. They're the ones that commissioned Christopher Columbus to sail across uh, the uh, Atlantic. And, uh, and, uh, but they also uh, had great hatred for the Jews, and they caused them to be dispelled back over into the Russia and to Poland again. When they went there, uh, the Roman Catholic Church again uh, persecuted them, and they accused uh, them, the Jews, of crucifying Christian children. They accused them of drinking the, uh, the blood of Christians during the Passover, and uh, because of that, they executed all kinds of horrors upon them. Uh, in one city, I can't say the two cities' name, there's two cities, they trampled over 3,000 Jews <coughs> to death under the horse's hoof. Do you get the idea? This can go on for some period of time, but for the sake of our service this morning, I'll bring us up uh, to our modern era. And in this era, we find that the Jews had been under persecution in Germany for century after century. And then when Hitler uh, began his rise into Germany, uh, guess who he decided that he was going to persecute? The Jews. <coughs> But you know what took place? When he began the persecution of the Jews, now listen, I've told you all of this to show you, though God's judgment was upon these people, any other people by now would have been annihilated. I'm telling you, the things that I've just briefly described to you are only a small, small, small bit. I've just picked out through the centuries a, a, an instance of two of the history of Jews. Any other group of people would have been annihilated and done away with. When Hitler began to persecute the Jews in, in uh, Germany, there were 16 and a half million Jews there. Instead of, of, of being annihilated under their persecution, God continued to keep his promise to the Jews. That's important. Because if God would fail to keep his promises to Abraham, if God would fail to keep his promise to Isaac, if God would fail to keep his promise to Jacob, if God would fail to keep his promises to King David, then we could not trust God to keep his promises to us. But praise be to God, God says here that he kept his promises, and though they have been persecuted, though the trial has been great, though the struggle has been difficult, 
there still remains a remnant. Amen. And you know the story of the great persecution where over six million Jews were put to the death chamber in Germany. Jesus sees all this when he says in verse 39, For I say to you, you shall see me no more. But then there's a wonderful word. He says, till. You shall see me no more till you say, we read this verse before, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. He says there is a restoring day. There is a regathering day. God is not done with the nation of Israel. God is going to bring that nation back into the promise prominence and you live in the day when that nation that has been persecuted has been ridiculed has been harassed has been by the devil tried to be annihilated but God has said they will remain and you've lived in the day when you see the nation state of Israel return to the to the stage of the world and today there is no more prevalent name in the news than the name of Israel within the last few months we have moved our embassy back to the capital of Jerusalem. So he says, For I say to you, you will see me no more till they say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. I'm here to tell you this morning, you're seeing the fulfillment of that last phrase. There's coming a day soon when this church is going to be removed and a time is going to come upon the earth and upon the nation of Israel as has not yet been seen. More horrible than anything I've, I've read to you this morning. There's coming a time of persecution. It's a time, the Bible says, is a time of Jacob's trouble. But at the end of that time, the Jewish nation will bow its knee and look and acknowledge the Savior, the Sovereign, who comes from the heaven, and they will call Him Lord and Savior. That day is swiftly approaching. You can see it not only on your scripture, you can see it on the headlines of every newspaper. You can see it in the news programs as they are broadcast in the television screens across our country. The day has come when Jesus will again be the redeemed of Israel. And then just in closing, we go to verse 24 and it says, Then Jesus went out and departed from the temple. No more solemn words could be stated than he departed. There's an Old Testament word that goes with that word. It is the word Ichabod. The Spirit of the Lord has departed. Now, so what does all this mean for me and for you? What it means for us is we need to see that God is long-suffering, God is good, God is merciful, but there comes a day when God says, enough is enough. I've done all I'm going to do. I've done all that's necessary. That's what he told these folks. He says, all that is necessary is to be done, and now it's over. And I want to tell you, when God drew that line in the sand of Israel, nothing can undraw it. And that great day of trouble continues. But I want to tell you here, God is a loving, kind, merciful, long-suffering God. But one day God says enough is enough. And when God draws that line, whether he draws it in your life or he draws it for this age in which we live in, when God says it's finished, guess what? It's finished. I believe that the Bible says whosoever will may come. And so as long as you have breath, you may come. But I do believe you can resist the Spirit of God so long that you won't come. Your heart will have become stubborn and stony and rebellious and your time is past. These folks waited too late. The line was drawn in the sand, and when God draws one, it's permanent. So the question for me and you this morning is where do we stand? Hey, are you trying to outlive the mercy of God? Or are you trying just to see how far God will go with you? I'll tell you, that is a dangerous place to be because there will come a day. There will come a time when God says enough is enough. And when he does that, listen, brother and sister, you want to be on God's right side. Because eternity is way too long to get it wrong.
This world is, is swiftly fleeting away. What you're going to do for God, you must do today. Or for tomorrow may not come. Father, help us see this truth. Help us know that your loving, goodness, kindness stretches far and wide. And the depth of your love cannot be measured. But just like you told these folks, you tell us. There is a time, there is a place, there is a point that we can go that's too far. Help us, Father, not to tempt or test you, but come running to your loving arms this morning that we can trust you and know that all is well in your family. Speak to our hearts lives this morning, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. As we stand and sing on an invitation to him. Number 488, just as I am. Ever been a time? Now is the time.